Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yep. All right, uh, just give me a minute while I get my iPad as well set up. Let's see. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, joining the uh, class today remotely. I have to go to Argonne National Lab uh, for some work, and I figured it was easier to just do this uh, remotely rather than running back and forth from home to my office with my flight. Uh, timing's pretty close. <laughs> um, all right. So does... Uh, Anyone, uh, before I get started on the, um, let me see here. And, and let's, okay. Hopefully you can see my uh, screen. Here. Um, okay, so before I get started on the lecture today, I just wanted to make sure everybody saw the um, supplementary video, um, which essentially concludes uh, some of the ray tracing that I was talking about in the last class. It gives some more examples of ray tracing with different situations. Um, in the last class, I think I did two examples of like uh, of uh, ray tracing, uh, and then in the in the lecture, I do a couple more examples, and then also talk about the human eye. Um, I just want to make sure everybody saw that. Um, I also noticed that some of you, um, for example, there were a couple of quiz questions in Canvas that were due. Um, so in one had to do with real objects versus virtual objects. Uh, if you're still feeling confused, uh, or go, I, I noticed that some of you got that wrong. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that everybody is now on the same page, that you understand that real objects are ones from which all the rays are emerging or diverging away. And virtual objects are ones where the rays appear to be converging to. And similarly, real image is one where all the rays appear to be converging. And uh, virtual image is one where the rays appear to be diverging from. So, OK, so hopefully that's all clarified for everyone. And then I think there was one more example where I asked you to think about a situation of uh, and try to reason either by like thinking about how the image formation works from a positive lens and a negative lens about general properties of the image. And this is something that you will find on your test question, for example, that uh, I'll ask you to like predict, or even if you don't calculate, like predict approximately what the uh, where the object position and the, and the size and so on, what do they look like? So that's something that you should get more familiar with again. If you're, if you're not sure, then just come and talk to me. Um, you know, I will have office hours next week. I'll announce some because I know uh, we'll have the test, which which I'll talk about in today's uh, lecture. So let's see. I want to hide this panel for sure. Uh, no, and also I want to hide. Okay. Yes. So in today's, um, oops, in today's, oh, what did I do there? Okay. 
Okay. In today's lecture, I'm going to talk about a few optical instruments, the human eye. Uh, we'll, we already covered some of it in that supplementary lecture, 11A, about the cornea, the lens, and the retina. And uh, today we'll talk about some more instruments that we might use to like help the human eye, uh, magnifying glass being one of them. And then also the other ones are the telescope and the microscope. So before I do that, let me talk about exam one. Um, exam one will be posted as a take-home exam next Friday, October 13th. <laughs> um, and it will consist of two parts on grade scope. Uh, it'll be, you'll be submitting it all through grade scope. Excuse me. Part one will be a multiple choice exam, part two, a long answer exam. Um, so part one, of course, you'll just turn in directly on grade scope. And part two, you should uh, turn it in. You know, there'll be exam questions, a PDF, and you can print them out and work out the solutions right on the exam itself, typically. Or you, you can have pieces of paper with your solutions to each question clearly marked. And then when you upload the exam, I mean, all these instructions will be with the exam itself, but I want to reiterate this because people often forget to do this. When you upload the exam back, please, in grade scope, you get a choice of like making sure that you identify which pages have which question on them. So uh, that's important to make sure that the correct points get applied to your, to your solution. So please make sure to do that. Okay, yes, and as I said, you'll have approximately 24 hours to finish the exam. It's usually due by midnight the following day. Um, okay, does anyone have any questions about that so far? Oh, um, last thing is the syllabus material is everything covered up to, ugh, up to this lecture, lecture level. So up to today's lecture, whatever is on the, uh, is covered will be, um, is is appropriate for this uh, exam one. Anyone have any questions? Okay, I mean, we'll have a couple classes next week, so we can, if you have questions by then, we can talk about it. Okay, so in, oh, before I get started, I'm just curious, let me just um, stop the share for a second. And get out of this. I'm just curious, how many of you went to the colloquium this Monday by Dr. Professor Rachel Bizanson? How many of you were in there? You can just raise your hand or whatever on reaction if you on the on the Zoom. How many of you were uh, there at the at the colloquium? Not many, nobody, nobody went to the colloquium. Oh, that's too bad. Uh, let me see, uh, let me see if I can bring that picture up. Hopefully I can. So I saw one, uh, ah, yes, here it is. Um, let me see if I can share this. I saw this one picture uh, on her uh, slides. So this compares the size of the mirror in the Hubble telescope to the size of the mirror in the James Webb Space Telescope. I'm sure you're all aware about the James Webb Space Telescope, correct? Right, everybody knows that, that we have this beautiful, amazing telescope that has been um, uh, has been sitting now at the Lagrange point and is taking incredible images of faraway galaxies and revolutionizing sort of, there was op-eds in the New York Times about how the James Webb Space Telescope might be completely overturning our models of cosmology of the universe and when galaxies were formed. Now, I think the, that's why we had this colloquium by Dr. Bezanson, by, by the Professor Bezanson. She uh, was talking about some of that stuff, of course, but I thought this picture fits in perfectly with a topic that we just covered in uh, class a couple lectures ago, which is why is it that you know James Webb is so much better than Hubble? I mean, there are other things, aspects of it that are way better, but 
One of the main reasons is that the primary mirror in the James Webb telescope is about 6.5 meters as opposed to the Hubble telescope of 2.4 meters. And what does this mean? Well, we talked about this a couple of lectures ago. You remember we talked about the image brightness and I said image brightness is proportional to the diameter of the lens squared, okay? And that holds the same for mirrors as well, okay? Uh, it's the same reasoning, the same logic, the light get collecting power is proportional to d squared, the, the mirror area basically. And that's exactly one of the reasons that the James Webb telescope is so much more powerful, seven times more powerful than the Hubble because it's, it goes as a square of those diameters. So it's not just 6.5 by 2.4, but 6.5 by 2.4 of the whole square. Okay, so that's one reason. And then she also compared that to another telescope, which is maybe a little bit more relevant because James Webb operates in the infrared region of wavelengths more than in the visible. Hubble is a visible telescope, whereas James Webb is uh, more operating towards the, it, it, it just gets the edge of the visible, like 600, it's fairly weak there not very very good, but then it goes out to like almost a um, few microns in, in wavelength, I think. I can't remember the exact numbers right now off the top of my head, but it's, um, it's, it's you know, it's operating more in the infrared. And compared to the Spitzer, which is the other infrared telescope we have out there, you can see the ratio is 6.5 by 0.85. So the, it's almost 60 times more powerful than the Spitzer telescope. Uh, this is just another uh, picture uh, comparing those, uh, you know, James Webb and Spitzer and James Webb and, and Hubble. And the other important thing, this is something I won't be talking about for a, quite a few more lectures. This comes from wave optics, which is that the smallest resolved object of a telescope is dependent on the wavelength of light divided by the telescope diameter. And this actually is also somewhat, we've talked about it a little bit in terms of like depth of field that, that goes as one over uh, the diameter. And uh, there's a similar argument for why the smallest resolved object depends on this wavelength of light by telescope diameter. Anyway, so I just thought that was really cool that, um, you know, something that we talked about in lecture uh, showed up right away in one of the slides for the telescopes. It's It's one of the common thing. So in case you didn't know that, now you know why it goes as the diameter squared and why James Webb is more powerful than, um, than the other telescopes. Okay, any questions on that before I move on? Okay, so in the last lecture, 11a, I talked about the uh, the human eye, this is again just a cross section and it talks about how small, there's a small region in the center, at uh, the center, which is the one that gives us most of our color vision and our sharpest vision uh, detection due to the presence of the cones uh, in that region. And of course, the eyeball is constantly moving to try and project the light uh, onto that fovea. Okay, and then I talked about the accommodation. By accommodation, I mean that in the relaxed condition of the eyeball, which you know, the eyeball looks a little bit like a baseball here, um, the eye is focusing rays that are far away at infinity onto the retina, which is in its relaxed condition, anything about, let's say, five meters. And then as the, as the object approaches closer and closer, the eyeball has to contract a little bit and converge those rays faster, uh, essentially, onto the retina to make them, uh, to make the, uh, the, the image on the retina. So basically is not the distance between the lens and the eye that is moving, the retina that's moving, because obviously the eye is a certain fixed size, uh, approximately the same in all humans. So it's really the curvature, the shape of this, uh, of this uh, lens that is changing to like cause the, um, to cause this accommodation as, it's, as it is called. And the accommodation, um, that even though the eye is really a double lens system, like I mentioned in the lecture, there's a cornea lens and then there's a crystalline lens. We just often model it as only the single lens because really it's only the crystalline lens, which is like a green lens, as I said in the, in the lecture, that's the one that has to carry out this fine focusing, this accommodation of the, of the eye, okay? And I, again, will redefine the near point, which is, you know, I am defining, I, I said, I mentioned it in the last, uh, in the 11A lecture, but is the closest object distance that can be brought into focus on the retina by the accommodated eye. Accommodated meaning 
after it has contracted as much as it can, then the closest object distance that can be brought into focus is uh, is 25 centimeter in adults. Uh, it may be better for young people versus, and then it gets worse as you get older. And the far point, again, is the farthest object distance that can be brought into focus on the retina by the relaxed type. Because remember, again, as we get further and further out, uh, the eye can just go back to being you know, relaxed and still will take all those rays that are parallel to each other and make them converge to infinity. Okay, let me hide this again. So what are the typical ty types of eye defects? One of the most common eye defects is the, the problem that uh, in myopia, the far point is too close. So that means that far away objects are not focused properly onto the eye. And so we have to use, uh, and as I'll show you, a negative lens is what is typically used to then uh, create a, a virtual object at the far point. So you can see that here. You can see the curvature of that lens is a little bit, you know, the eye, the eyeball, instead of becoming more like, um, you know, uh, instead of contracting enough to focus the, the uh, in the relaxed condition, what's happening is that the parallel beams of light are getting focused to a point that is close away from the retina, that is they're in front of the retina. And so this is one of the most common defects. I am certainly myopic. And similarly, there's hyperopia or hypermetropia where the parallel rays of light get focused beyond behind, behind the retina, okay, there. So what happens in hyperopia or hypermetropia is that the near point is too far. So that means that objects that are too close to your eye don't get focused onto the retina, they get focused uh, further out, okay? So we use a positive lens to bring that near point closer. So this is shown here. So in a farsight or that hyperopia, another word for it is farsightedness. And of course, my, myopia is nearsightedness. So, so in hyperopia, then we correct this uh, fact. Of course, as I said, it's the near point that's too far, even though it says far, right? You're better off at further distances than you are at the near distances. As you, as you all know, I now need you know reading glasses to, <laughs> to, to read anything that's close to my eye as well. And so uh, what we do is we use a positive lens. And you can think about this for, based on sort of the last week's sort of supplementary lecture where I said, or at the, at the end of the lecture that if you if you bring um, you know two lenses together, then the converging power of the two lenses is effectively, you can think of it as a combination of the powers of the two lenses. So in this case, you have uh, one converging lens and then once you add another converging lens that increases the total converging power. And so rays that previously were focusing too far away get focused closer in and if effectively they focus on the retina more correctly. Similarly, for the myopic eye, we want that uh, uh, the far the the far point. Oops. Sorry. We want uh, the 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 far point to be projected out. So we use a negative lens, and that reduces essentially. The, the total converging power, and that creates a virtual object at the far point that is uh, that we can uh, accommodate. And that now brings the object from, uh, the, the image is now, instead of being projected in front of the retina, gets projected onto the retina correctly. Okay. So obviously, I mean, that's, you know, something that many of you are familiar with, uh, having to wear spectacles um, or contact lenses. And uh, it, basically, it just the normal eye, which the bio, I guess the medical term for that is ametropic, is has a far point at infinity. I already mentioned this, and the ametropic or abnormal eye can have a variety of conditions like myopia and apropia, and one more which I which I'll introduce in a minute, which is called astigmatism. Again, as I said already, it's due to changes in the length of the eyeball or the curvature rather than defects in the cornea or the lens, but both can occur. And the correction lenses that I was just talking about, you know, the converging or diverging lens for the different situations, farsightedness or nearsightedness, then uh, they are they are classified by the dioptric power. You know, so the dioptric power script D is equal to one over F. And the units are, of course, one over uh, length. So one over uh, one meter inverse is classified, uh, is, is quantified as one diopter. Okay. 
And since we know for a, for a, from the lens maker formula that one over F equals N minus one times one over R one minus one over R two, this gives us a prescription for uh, the diopter in terms of the radius of curvature of each individual lens that you might make. And you can see right away that as this R1 goes um, to infinity, this, you get closer and closer to a piece of glass, the dioptric power goes to zero. And as R1 becomes um, you know, infinity, just as a plain piece of glass, whereas of course, uh, as you curve it more, R1 becomes uh, uh, you know, away from infinity, smaller than infinity, then the dioptric power increases. And uh, I already said that for lenses that are in contact, you can just add up the dioptric powers or the powers of the lenses as just d1 plus d2, the converging uh, powers. If it's two, if it's two uh, converging lenses, then they'll just add up uh, together to give you a higher uh, power. Okay. Um, and uh, the another eye defect that is very common is so far we've been assuming that everything is symmetric around the axis of the optical axis. So we've been able to just get away with drawing one plane for the lens, you know, we can just treat the lens as, as symmetric around the axis as just a, 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 a circle. And also all the focusing, the rays, et cetera, everything is behaving the same way, whether it's in the plane of the paper or the screen in this case, or in a plane that's perpendicular to the plane of the, of the paper or the optical axis. And so we see here that in astigmatism, what's happening is, so this is the optical axis, the line joining P to this point S1. And the blue rays over here uh, indicate the plane that we normally consider, right? That we normally are sketching the rays that are in that plane. But you can also consider rays that are out of that plane, perpendicular to that plane. And of course, there are all the situations in between, but it's enough to consider the, the plane the, that's over there. That's a meridional plane, as we call it. And then the sagittal plane is this red uh, plane over here, which is perpendicular to the meridional plane. And as you can see here, the point P gets imaged onto the point S1 over here. And uh, rays that come from the same point P but are lying in the sagittal plane, they end up at the point T1. So you can see that the two planes have entirely different focus and that's called astigmatism, okay? Um, yeah, and the way I've drawn it is that these two planes are perpendicular as shown for a lens here, and that can be corrected with a cylindrical lens. A cylindrical lens is shown down here on this um, uh, on this uh, drawing. Uh, by the way, can everyone see my pointer over here? Yes. The the mouse. I mean, I've been indicating with this mouse pointer. Hopefully, you can all see it. Uh, if you can't, just let me know. Um, so this. Um, so this, um, this cylindrical lens basically is curved in this direction in one amount, and then in the other direction, that is in the meridional plane, it's curved in a different different way, different amount, okay? Uh, but of course, that assumes that the two planes, that the two foci uh, that from these two planes are exactly what is causing the problem, which may not be the case. That's called irregular astigmatism, and that's much harder to correct, okay? Again, the cause of this is, Basically, the eye has distorted more into ellipsoidal shape than into a more spherical shape as is normal in a normal eye, okay? Um, and that results in blurred images no matter whether it's near or far away because you're now forming two images for rays that are coming in different uh, planes, okay? All right, uh, one more word. If you want to know this, you may hear this word sometimes is that if you have an optical system with different magnifications, which will obviously be the case because the object and image distances are different, in the two planes. So when that happens, you have different magnifications in the different transverse planes, and that's called an anamorphic optical system. So a cylindrical lens will be anamorphic, basically. So uh, let me just pause the video uh, or pause the share here for a second. So here's a question for uh, all of you. Um, okay. Um, since the lens of an eye is a positive lens, why doesn't the image appear inverted in our, you know, when we look at the screen and I'm reading it, okay, uh, we we know that we don't have to like, you, you've already seen in your lab that, you know, when, uh, when you put your, uh, um, when you put your uh, object, you, you can clearly see that the image is inverted with respect to the object because of the positive lens. But we are not having to do that. Even though our eye is a positive lens, 
you know, the, the both the corneal lens and the cylindric uh, and the crystalline lens in the eye are both positive lenses. And yet it's not like I'm going to have to take the screen and flip it up, right? To like read it correctly. Um, or, you know, when I look at an object in nature, Eiffel Tower, whatever, right? It's not like I have to like, you know, turn my head upside down to, to view the Eiffel Tower correctly. So why, what is going on, you think, that we are able to view these objects still regularly? Any idea? Anyone want to hazard a guess? Yes, Howard. Isn't it that like um, we like our our optic nerve does see it upside down, but then like our brain flips it because that just is what we you know if everything is upside down, then it doesn't really matter. Right, right, exactly. So what's happening is that the brain, the processing system in the brain, and people have actually done experiments. I, I mean, not with human uh, things, but you know, with like other uh, animals or whatever, they have like uh, observed this effect that you know if they uh, remove certain parts. Of the brain, then then everything becomes you know completely confused, and uh, you lo they lose that ability to uh, view the view the the correct orientation of the of the object. So yeah, exactly. So this is a massive trick that is being pulled off by our brain constantly. Okay, isn't that incredible? To me, it's incredible. It's like constantly just inverting the images inside by circuitry, you know, neuronal circuitry or something, to like make. The image, the image up here uh, uh, in the correct direction. This is also, of course, why you might wonder, like, you know, eyewitness testimony and stuff, you know, if anything were to go wrong with the brain, you know, something is wrong, then, uh, and I already mentioned, you know, like all of our vision is down to this tiny little region, like a few hundred microns, the fovea, that's where you have the sharpest vision in the brain, uh, in, the, in the eye, sorry. And so, uh, of course, outside of that region, you still have some vision, but you know, color identification becomes worse. Uh, your your resolution, your your ability to reconstruct images is not as good. So these are all questions to ask. You know, in terms of like, or, or things to think about at least for sure about how good our vision actually is. And you know, this is one of the reasons people are thinking. You know, eyewitness testimony may not be as good as we used to think it was. For example. Okay, so going back to. Uh, our slides, let's see. Okay, let's now talk about an optical instrument, uh, the magnifying glass. Um, I'm sure you all played with this as kids. Um, uh, anyway, so when we look at objects that are very close to, 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 our, to the near point, this is the unaided eye. So here's an eye with nothing in front of, you know, no uh, lens, nothing added to it. Um, and I'm looking at a small object, like a little bee or a little insect. And um, of course, you know, to, to make, why do we bring the object close to us when it's small is to increase the angle that is being made by these rays coming from the edge of the object onto our eye. So that's kind of, you know, you see this little blob down here. That little blob there is the image of this object down in our eye and the angle that is being subtended by this object on our eye, the retina, on the retina, is this angle alpha u, right? Alpha u is the angle being made by the ray that goes through the center of the eyeball, and uh, not eyeball, but the lens, and is unaffected. You know, it's the chief ray for the system. And that angle alpha u is what we think of as the size of the object, because that's what we are, the, the larger the angular size, you know, the larger we think the object is, okay? And, um, and you know, at the near point, this is the angle Remember, once you get closer than the near point, we can't focus on the object anyway, so we won't get a sharp image, okay? So it doesn't matter, we can't bring it much closer without losing the sharpness. And this near point, as I mentioned, we always take it to be 0.25 meters for adults. So the first uh, sort of instrument that we can make to improve this, uh, you know, the size of the object is to introduce a positive lens whose focal length is greater than the distance between this object and the and the, and the, and and the, and the lens itself so the so basically the object is now closer than a focal length for, to the lens and as you know from our discussions when an object is less than a focal length away from the positive lens you get a virtual image and this virtual image is magnified relative to the object and you can see that here the rays that are coming out from this object are basically appear to be diverging 
from this uh, point over here. So this is a virtual image. And so this lens here treats this virtual image as the, the object and then makes a bigger image over here, a real image, of course, on the retina, OK? And uh, now from this, uh, you can calculate, I mean, you can use you know, the standard formulas. You can calculate how much this angle alpha A, you can see this angle over here. Alpha A is the angle uh, that is created by these rays coming from the edges of this, uh, uh, fr from the top edge of this object to the optical axis, alpha A. That's the aided angle of magnification. Okay, so, or, or, so basically alpha A represents the angular size with the aid, the aid in this case being the magnifying lens. And alpha U is the unaided eye. So that's the regular angular size without any uh, adding anything, okay, to the eye. The aided eye versus the unaided eye. So that's the A and the U subscripts. Okay, there are three cases of interest. I'm going to ignore the first two. Uh, you can derive them again from this geometry and knowing the lens equations and all that. Uh, the typical uh, situation is when we keep the object distance as not at almost a focal length away, in which case now the rays will appear to be coming from infinity, which is best for our eye. Our eye is most relaxed when the rays appear to be coming from infinity. And then we can find or we can define this magnifying power, which is the, size, the ratio of the two angular sizes in the aided case and the unaided case. And you can calculate that to be exactly d naught times d, where d is the dioptric power of this extra converging lens that we have introduced. And this is the most common situation, and that helps us because then we don't have to accommodate our eye. Okay. So uh, standard magnifying uh, glasses have uh, you know magnifications, which are uh, from this equation. You can see that you know because d naught is 0.25 meters. And the dioptric power, of course, is meter inverse. So if it's 10 diopters, right, then the total magnifying power will be 0.25 times 10, which is 2.5, which is exactly what this is, uh, 2.5. And that's denoted by 2.5x. So the object now looks 2.5 times bigger on our eye with the magnifying glass. Uh, the angular size has increased by that amount. And that's what typical reading glasses, dwellers, loops, et cetera, are. If you're just going to use one lens, that's pretty much what the maximum you can get up to. OK, because there are aberrations and so on, things that I haven't discussed, but imperfections basically of imaging uh, that restrict it to that value for large fields of view. But with multi-lens magnifiers, here are some examples. The simplest one you can think of is instead of just using one positive lens, you can use two. That's a doublet. Then there are doublets that are directly in contact with each other. There's a triplet Hastings and you know other kinds of uh, uh, eyepieces that are magnifiers, these are multi-lens magnifiers, you can get up to 10X or 20X. But really at that point, you're better off using something called an eyepiece or ocular, which is usually eyepieces or oculars, sorry, let me hide this again. Eyepieces or oculars are used to view some intermediate objects that's formed by another optical system, such as a microscope or telescope. So here's a eyepiece. So um, this is the first eyepiece that was invented. It's called the Huygens eyepiece. And in the Huygens eyepiece, what is happening is that it takes rays that um, uh, were forming a, a virtual object over here, which was being formed by some objective lens over here, and then creates a, a real image over here in this region, okay? And this first lens basically creates that real image, which then serves as the object for the second lens, the eye lens, and that ends up giving us parallel rays of light. Again, helps our eye to be un, unstrained, you know, in relaxed position. And it creates the these parallel beams of light at a distance from the final lens. And that distance is called the eye relief because it's, it's nice if you're not having to like stick your eye right up against the lens to view the, uh, view the, the image. And so having built in a decent amount of eye relief is nice. In this case, it is only three millimeters. In some of these other ones, it's much greater. Again, uh, another restriction of this Huygens lens was that Huygens eyepiece was that the incoming rays also needed to be parallel, to be converging. So you needed to form some kind of object over here, which is a virtual object, which is shown here for this lens. And uh, that is now uh, something that we want to fix in the other situations over here. Um, 
and the outgoing rays are parallel to each other. I think that's nice because that helps the eye to be relaxed. Okay. And again, the magnifying power, which turns out to be quite universal for, for different reasons, is just D naught times the power of the combined system of these two lenses. Okay. Uh, there are several other ones. I won't go through them. The Ramsden, the Kellner, these were probably very popular. But probably the most popular ones right now are the symmetric, or I, I don't know how to say his name, or their, their name, Plossil, I think, and Erfel eyepieces. These tend to be the most uh, popular ones right now that are in use uh, in most modern telescopes or microscopes. Okay, so that brings me to probably an important, uh, the, one of the most important instruments that we have in the lab or in, 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 uh, in, uh, that, that has been enabled through uh, optical technology, which is the microscope or the compound microscope. So as you saw, the magnifying glass gives you up to like two to three X powers, maybe 10 X. The eyepieces can give you a bit more, 10 X quite easily, and maybe going up to 20 or 30 X. But at some point, if you want like much larger magnifications, and as you'll see, the total magnification of the compound microscope can be the product of magnifications of two lenses. And so you can make it you know, extremely large, uh, up to a thousand, for example, okay? Um, so uh, the way the, the magnifying, uh, the compound microscope works is that there's an objective lens, which is again, close to the object, which is a pretty small object. And this creates a real image in between these two uh, lenses. This is formed over here, as you can see. And this uh, real image is now lying a focal length away from the eyepiece lens. So that creates parallel rays of light, okay? And those are then focused onto the retina or onto a camera by another lens, for example, when you are using a compound uh, microscope. And the distance between the uh, focal length of the, uh, or the focal plane of the objective lens and the first image, the intermediate image as is shown here, is called the tube length of the microscope. This is a very important parameter when you look at microscopes. Uh, you need to know the tube length for various reasons, as I'll explain. And the second thing that you, you'll notice is that I'm also tracing out the rays that are going uh, not just straight down the microscope, like in this situation, but also which are going at an angle, which is the chief ray over here, which goes straight through the center of the objective, makes it through and then bends and then forms this, uh, you know, it goes straight through the center of the eyeball, the exit pupil, as it's called. Um, and you can also trace out another ray, which now goes through, uh, through the object focal plane of this objective. So it's going to emerge parallel, and that's where the intermediate image is formed. And then when it goes through here parallel, it's going to then get converged by the, uh, through the image focal point of the eyepiece. And so you can draw these two rays backward, and so you can see the image is appearing at infinity, which is good, again, for the relaxed eye. And also you can see how much it has increased. That two rays which are emerging with, you know, um, you know, at the small angle away from the axis are now appearing at a much larger angle relative to the, the eyeball, to the, to the eye, okay? All right, so that this just summarizes all that stuff that I just said. And uh, the tube length is very important, as I've said, and usually these days it's standardized, okay? The tube length uh, for like different microscope companies is like uh, given typically 160 or 210 as shown for these two companies. I might have mixed up these company, which one is which, but you know, you get the idea. You need to know this. And the reason for that, as I'll explain in a minute, is because of the magnifying power, you know? So you can see that the total magnifying power of the compound microscope is just a product of the transverse magnification. Remember, there's a real image that is created here. So this image here has some size. So this just looks like a regular lens, right? So it's just a regular lens with a real image in between. So you can just take the image distance divided by the object distance, and that gives you the magnification of this first lens. And that's this MTO, the transverse magnification of the objective. Similarly, there's an angular magnification of the eyepiece, which is because again, you know, the eyepiece is a focal length away from this intermediate image. So you need to know where to locate the eyepiece in the microscope system. Again, by the formulas that we have seen already for, um, for, a, for a lens, the transverse magnification is simply Xi, the distance where the image is formed divided by F naught, the FO being the uh, objective focal length. And in this case, since Xi is simply L, right? It's the distance from the image focal point to the intermediate image, L. So that's why the tube length tells us right away the magnifying power 
of the objective given the focal length of the objective. Usually actually what people do when they give you an objective, a Nikon objective or a Zeiss objective, whatever it is, is they'll just specify the magnifying power. They'll tell you this is a 100X Nikon objective, for example. And then if you want to find the focal length of that objective, you use this formula to calculate its focal length so that you know approximately where to place the object relative to this objective or for any other application that you're building, for example. Okay, so that, for example, I just chose the 160 millimeter for the objective. And then for the eyepiece, as we've already seen, that's just given by the near point, 250 millimeters, divided by the focal length of that. Uh, uh, that's just the angular magnification of a lens, you know? And so I've just chosen these as thin lenses, but this is pretty standard. Again, by the, even if it's a complicated eyepiece, the way that if, if you ask what's the focal length of the eyepiece, they'll give you the magnifying power of the eyepiece and you just divide by 250 millimeters by that will give you the focal length of that eyepiece as well. So you'll know where approximately uh, to put it relative to the intermediate image or the field stop as it is called. Okay. All right. So that tells you a little bit about microscopes and there are many types of microscope objectives that you can purchase. So, um, you know, and there are three basic, uh, besides the thing about the tube length and the magnifying power of the objective, uh, you can also ask for it to be cover glass corrected, meaning it can look through a thin piece of glass. Uh, many kind of biological samples are often protected by a cover glass. Um, similarly, you can look at metallurgical samples or like uh, semiconductors, you know, you're inspecting some defects in a chip, et cetera. Then you don't want this cover glass correction. You can buy those as well. Uh, working distance, a long working distance, meaning the objective can be far away from the sample that you're studying. Immersion is probably one of the most common things in biological uh, samples. Like you just have your sample on a, on a glass slide, you cover it up with a cover glass, and then you put a drop of like oil or water. And then the objective is meant to work with that oil or water in contact with the objective, because that reduces sort of some of the bending of the rays as they exit from the glass into the, uh, as they go through the cover glass into the objective, there will be usually bending. And, you know, you all already understood about total internal reflection, which restricts the, the size of the image, the, the angular size of the rays that can come from the, from the object. Well, to reduce that, you, if you can match the index of the oil or the water, whatever it is, to the cover glass, you now reduce that, uh, that bending and, and increase essentially the, the angle of the rays that you can collect. Probably the most important parameter that objectives are specified by is something called the numerical aperture or NA. This is similar to the numerical aperture in a fiber. It basically controls the angle of the rays that are accepted by the, um, by the, uh, by the, uh, by the objective. Um, when I told you about uh, the brightness of a lens and I told you that the image brightness is controlled is proportional to D divided by F whole squared, I forgot to mention that F over D so is equal to the F number, uh, you know, so F number is simply one uh, is, is F over D. And since we saw that the, um, um, the, um, the brightness, the image brightness goes as D squared over F squared, that's basically one over F number squared. So the smaller the F number, the, uh, the, then the larger the, the brightness of the image that is controlled. And similarly, that also turns out to be proportional to NA. So one over, or rather D over F is again, proportional to NA, which means that the larger the NA, the larger the brightness. Okay, so NA is actually a little bit more, I think, a helpful parameter than F number. But in camera lenses, you'll often see that it's F number that is quoted for the camera lens. So the telescope has probably been invented several times over. The first patent application was by Lippershey. I think I mentioned this. And the primary function, again, is to enlarge the retinal image of distant objects. The Keplerian telescope, uh, sorry, that was supposed to come up here. Ah, there it is. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, the Keplerian telescope uh, magnifies far away, but finite distance objects. So it's not truly, you know, meant to uh, look at objects that are very, very far away uh, or infinitely far away. So it's more like a terrestrial telescope, something, you know, you might use it on a ship, you know, to look at another uh, ship. Um, and that one does create an in inverted intermediate image. So this in in intermediate image over here, as you can see, is clearly inverted. I'm not going into the details of the Keplerian telescope. And even the final image then is going to be inverted. So, but that's fine for like, uh, you know, most people can make that uh, correction in their brain that uh, they're looking at an inverted object. Um, 
Uh, the astronomical telescope, however, operates with what are called infinite or afocal conjugate points, where both the object and the image are at infinity. So the object is very far away. And then, of course, our eyeball is best when it's looking at far away. Uh, you know, it, 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 it operates with uh, in the relaxed eye condition. And uh, as you saw in the lab, this is also useful for collimating and reshaping laser beams as well. And this is the astronomical telescope, which I'll, in, which I'll show you on the next slide in a little bit more detail. Basically, it increases the angle of this chief ray that is being made to, if you follow this, the chief ray, you'll see that the angle that it makes with respect to the optical axis increases. And I'll show you that on the next slide. So in uh, almost all uh, telescope systems, uh, you know, typical telescope systems, at least F1 and F2 will be greater than zero. And then D will be equal to F1 plus F2. You remember we did ray tracing where D was either greater than F1 plus F2 or lesser than F1 plus F2 for different focal length combinations. Here, we're going to see that D is equal to F1 plus F2. Okay, so again, I'm going to take an astronomical telescope. Uh, I'm going to adopt the sign convention that the angle of a ray that's sloping down because you had to rotate this ray clockwise from the optical axis. So imagine a ray that was directly along the optical axis. If I want to make it slope down, I take that ray and I rotate it clockwise in that in that direction. Uh, clockwise, uh, you know, clockwise is going around like that and anti-clockwise is going around like that. So the clockwise direction is a negative sign for the angles. So this, this ray would be described by a negative angle with respect to the optical axis. And um, okay, so just tracing through this ray, we can use the usual a focal uh, or focal plane uh, ray tracing. We, we take this point here, draw the line to the image focal point, and then you can see that's the exact amount of bending that this ray undergoes. Similarly, this ray does the same thing, and they come over here, and you can see now that the angle has increased for these two uh, lenses in this condition. So we can now derive that, and of course, uh, you know we. We see here that uh, I've just drawn an object, you know, just to give you an idea, these are the two edges of the object, and these are the two rays that make it through the system. Here's a second ray that I also traced. This ray is also coming from this top point here, except that it's displaced because it's, it's you know, it's, it's basically at the same angle, but it's just displaced with respect to that uh, first ray over here, and it makes it through the focal uh, plane, the object focal plane, and then comes out parallel, and then will come out here to form the, that makes a, an intermediate image over here uh, because that, that's where these two rays uh, exactly coincide. Okay, And so now we can easily calculate the magnifying power. Remember, the magnifying power is always the angle with the aided. In this case, the telescope is aiding us divided by the angle of the unaided eye. So without the telescope, the angle that this ray would make is just alpha. But with the telescope, it's now making the angle alpha A. Okay, So first we calculate alpha uh, or alpha U. So tan alpha u is just given by this triangle here. So BC is the distance between these two rays when they hit the lens over here. And uh, that uh, divided by the focal length gives me the tan alpha u, and it's a negative because uh, the angle is negative. Okay. And uh, similarly, tan alpha a is DE. Now remember that DE must be equal to BC because this ray just makes it through parallel. So that's DE divided by now the focal length of the second uh, lens, which is the eyepiece. So that's DE divided by FE. So I'll just finish up this derivation here. So the magnifying power is simply minus FO divided by FE. When I take the ratio between alpha A and alpha U, and knowing that BC and DE are basically the same length over here. So they cancel out of this equation. So the magnifying power, as you can see, is going to be in the ratio of this focal length of the objective divided by the focal length of the eyepiece. So we want the focal length of the objective to be as large as possible to, to give us a high magnifying power, okay? So as you can see, the objective is basically imaged by the eyepiece. As you can see here, you know, we just take this objective, it's exactly a focal length away from this, uh, from this eyepiece. So therefore it's going to be imaged perfectly onto the, the eyepiece. And so we can, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, so that gives us that the transverse magnification of the eyepiece is simply Fe divided by XO. And since XO is simply FO, that image in, in, intermediate is exactly a focal length away uh, from uh, an objective focal length away, that gives us that the transverse magnification of the eyepiece uh, is equal to one over the magnifying power of the, um, uh, of, the, of, the, of the telescope. And since the transverse magnification is defined 
as a ratio of the image diameter to the object diameter, right? I mean, that's what we call the transverse magnification. It's just height of the image divided by height of the object or image diameter divided by the object diameter. So we see that actually the transverse magnification for, for a beam, for example, leaving the eyepiece is smaller than the beam entering the objective. So the magnifying power equals the objective diameter by the image, uh, the eyepiece diameter, the beam diameter of the objective at the objective divided by the beam diameter at the eyepiece. So um, this is also can be seen maybe a little bit more easily by just drawing the rays uh, coming from the laser beam. So you see the laser beam comes in here, it gets uh, image to a point over here. And then because the objective focal length is usually much bigger than the eyepiece focal length, you see that it doesn't have as much space effectively to expand before it's then collimated. Sorry, this last, the last bit of this should be the beam coming out collimated, not expanding away here. The last uh, lens over here basically takes this diverging rays and makes them collimated. So you can immediately see that this output beam diameter is gonna be smaller than the input beam diameter coming into the telescope, okay? And this actually is a very common thing that the, um, that the transverse magnification of a telescope is always equal to one over the angular magnification. This is just a general result, that the transverse magnification is always one over the angular magnification, it's something that's uh, called the Lagrange invariant of the, of the telescope. Okay, I'm, I'm done, but I just wanted to conclude by talking about the Galilean telescope. You've seen this in your lab. So now instead of having two positive lenses, we have a positive lens and a negative lens. And uh, now it's just the same idea, except now that the distance between the objective and the eyepiece is lesser than, uh, than usual because uh, FO plus FE, but now FE is negative. So we want that uh, uh, the, the objective focal plane, which is over here, sorry, the, the object focal plane of the eyepiece, that is this L2, the object focal plane is over here. And we want that to be exactly one image focal length away from the objective, okay? So that's this FO and FE. Uh, and that's why the that's a more compact system, right? The, the Galilean telescope relative to the Keplerian telescope. And now the, um, so now the, um, the beam is um, you know, still magnified, but now you can make the system much more compact. It also doesn't produce an image in between, which for high power lasers, this can be an issue. If you're actually producing a spot in between the two, uh, the objective and the eyepiece, sometimes laser beams are so powerful, such as for example, in the National Ignition Facility, uh, where they're trying to create fusion, uh, but even down to even like regular labs nowadays, the powers can be so high that you can actually start to ionize and create plasma in the air if you focus it and that, you know, destroys many of the beam properties as well. So to avoid that, the Galilean telescope tends to be better if you're trying to like magnify the beam or something. Of course, it has a narrower field of view because, you know, you can, you can argue about that uh, however you want, but basically you can't focus some rays that previously you could focus because there's no longer a, a place. Um, um, anyway, so it's more useful really for the lab in laser beam expansion, basically. Okay, uh, many other imaging systems, the terrestrial telescope is just a version of the original Keplerian telescope, except now we have a system in between that makes it so that the beam actually, the image comes out actually uh, uh, upright instead of inverted. Okay, binoculars, just a system of like mirrors and lenses again to image far away objects onto your uh, the two parts of your eye uh, to, to, to each of your eyes. And that gives you like a full field of view, which is much more comfortable than peering through a single eyepiece. And even camera lenses, you can, you'll understand many of these parts of the camera and the camera single reflex lens cameras, et cetera, um, through these, uh, through now that you understand a lot more about, I think about lenses and lens systems. Okay, so that's it for today. Um, we summarize, oh, <laughs> I guess I forgot to finish that, human eye and various optical instruments. Okay, that's the lecture for today. I'm here for questions for some more time, if you need, if you have any. Uh, how do I stop the share? Uh, any questions? Okay, if not, have a good break, fall break, and I'll see you all next week.